Uh, hi. So, there was a, a prayer that I said, it's a poem prayer. Uh, before we started working, we were in Guatemala. And uh, Barb thought, or maybe it'd be nice if I shared it with you guys as well. But it's also important, um, this the backstory to it a little bit. So, I'm going to try to be brief, but I'm not very good at that. <laughs> um, when I, I grew up in Holstein and I went to the Presbyterian Church there, and when I was about 10 years old, I was matched with a, a prayer partner. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit when I, when I do my reflection on serving the Lord, but I like to call it like a match made in heaven because it was truly through God that I was matched up with this uh, amazing woman from my church. So when I met her, I think she was in her 70s. My sister's crying, I can't look over there. <laughs> um, she was uh, maybe in her 70s and I was about 10 years old. And it was just something we did for about a year. And so after church, you'd have lunch with your prayer partner. And it was someone that every day you were supposed to pray for them. And it was to make the congregation feel like no matter what troubles you go through, you're always being prayed for. There's always somebody that is praying for you. And she, uh, we only did this for about a year. And years after, I was still visiting her. <laughs> and she asked me one day, how long do I have you for? And I said, forever. <laughs> and uh, she's somebody that's taught me a lot uh, in faith. She is the strongest woman I've ever met. Good, strong Dutch woman. <laughs> she's... Lived, she lived in Holland and she went through the terrors of World War II and I would go for a quick coffee visit and I would be there for hours just hanging on her every word. Her stories and the life that she lived and what she went through was incredible. And about two years ago, went home to her God and I was so happy for her because she's always wanted to meet him and I miss her every day and I would give anything for one more story but it's pretty incredible that even in her passing she's still with me so very much and when she passed away I was given a book of poems and that's the one that I'm going to share with you today so even in her passing, she's been gone for two years and she's still teaching me about God and faith and everything. I had, I'm so thankful for the, the 14 years I had with her on earth, but for the rest of my life with her and when I get to meet her again in heaven. So, so now I'm going to share with you the poem. Um, the book's from 1948, so it's kind of old English. So it's a little tricky, so I'm going to go slow, uh, and then I'll just really briefly explain it in my reflections, what kind of the poem means to me and what it means for um, our missionary trip to Guatemala. <clears throat> the sun has risen, we too are awake. Hark to the murmur of the stirring land. I cannot see the road that I should take. Give me, O Lord, your hand. Lead me and place my feet upon the road that thou would have me travel through the day. My hand in thine, I shall endure the road, however long the way. Perchance the hill is steep, the valley rough. If thou but callest, I shall understand. Nor will I fear, for it will be enough if thou givest me thy hand. This was my pride, that I could walk alone. I had my intellect and my strength of will. But now, O oh Lord, most humbly do I own, to boast of this is ill. Thy constant guidance, Lord, is my sore need, for with thy guidance, blackest gulfs are spanned. From arrogance and self-importance breed, I find and clasp your hand. And we pray this because I felt it's important to remember that when you're doing mission work and working with others, that you're doing it to glorify God and you're just keeping him in the forefront and not for your own selfish ways or to be able to come home and say, look what I did. And, you know, it's for the right reasons. And to, to recognize that on our own, there's only so much we can do. But when we ask for God's help, 
and we ask for his blessing every day in Guatemala to help us with the wall, but, but much more than that, to help us with our relationships there, with our communications there. So every day for him to be holding our hands and to be walking with us and all the people we encountered, all the experiences we went through, and everything that happened while we were there and, and since we've been back and just every day, to be asking him to walk with us and to guide us because we all know his path is better than the one that we have created for ourselves. So thank you very much. Thank you, Carol. And our scripture readings. Isaiah 58 is not going to be responsive. The responsive is going to be from Philippians. And you'll see the bold print when we get to Philippians. Uh, so I'll explain in just a moment. Isaiah 58, verses 6 to 11. It is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke. To set the oppressed free and break every yoke. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe them, and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here am I. If you do away with the yoke of oppression and with the pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness, and your night will become like the new day. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land, and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. And from Paul's New Testament letter to the Philippian Christians, I'll read the first four verses, and then the next several will be responsive. You'll read the bold, and I'll read the non-bold, and then I'll conclude with the last two verses. Therefore, this is a passage that we read uh, several times um, when we were down in uh, Guatemala. Uh, quite unbeknownst to us, but of course knowing to God, it was the passage that we chose, but then it was also the passage that the church chose to read for us and with us when we were worshiping with them. Uh, it was a marvelous affirmation of, of gift uh, for us. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In their relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And to every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Amen. Thanks be to God for his word of life and hope and truth. And thanks for our team who are going to be sharing our reflections with you part first. First of all, I would like to apologize for the quality of the first few slides um, because they came from um, probably the first year or two that I went down to Honduras, which was in uh, 99, 2000. So the quality is not great, but anyways, here we go. 
and hopefully they advance. Um, I know that there's a lot of controversy about the value of short mission trips. Are they really of any value? Do they, have, do they really benefit the communities that serve, that receive the mission support? Over the years that I've done mission trips to Central America, I can definitely attest to the value of short-term missions. I've seen villages slowly rebound from devastating damages of houses, rebuilding communities, improving sanitation and water systems, receiving training and education to enable individuals to get jobs and occupations and so on and more. The focus through Missionary Ventures, the organization we went with, is to help individuals and villages to improve the quality of their lives, not to mold them into something they don't want to be or that we might expect them to come. The team members also benefit greatly from these types of trips, but in surprising ways. Many participants think they are going on these trips to help the less fortunate, only to discover that the less fortunate give back in so many ways. We receive their love, their generosity, their sense of strength, strong faith and belief in God. Our interpreter Robin, who we met this morning, shared a story with us about his first contact with the mission group. When Robin was a small child, his Sunday school group received a gift bag from a group, very similar to the gift bags that we took from our Sunday school. He could not believe the generous gift he received, never forgot how much he thanked God for putting those people in his life. This truly impacted his life, and he relived that moment when we were sharing the gift bags with the children we met. At KEPC, as we began planning our trip, we quickly realized that God had a plan for us. We thought we were going to Peru in the middle of May, uh, but that was quickly changed. Our plans got changed, and we couldn't have been happier about the project we ended up with. The people of Chiantla, uh, where the school was located, had been praying for help with their project for a considerable time. And we were, were informed by Missionary Ventures that, um, that a team was coming to help them build their wall, and of course they were thrilled. In Central America, all facilities that provide programs for children must have a security wall in place to protect the children and provide safe places for the children to learn and play. So all we were doing was building a part of a wall. But as you'll hear from the other team members, um, there is so much more to our adventure than just building a wall. And here's Mel. <laughs> question and answer at the end. Okay, so feel free or if you want to, if you have something that's really you know, in the back of your mind, throw your hand up and we'll address it. And I want to share with you a little bit about uh, the school. It's called Iglesia Monte Horeb and we felt that that was a place of love, caring, and joyful learning. It was just amazing, the, the atmosphere at that school. Uh, it's staffed by volunteers and uh, led by a wonderful princi principal, Luz, and her wonderful staff. And uh, there's a picture of, of the classrooms. And you can see a block stacked on, on top. They're hoping to build a second story there when they get funding for that. But there are classrooms that have uh, shops in them with uh, uh, sewing and woodworking. There's some of the staff welcoming us with their uh, uh, signs there, the flags of Canada and uh, Guatemala. And they sang songs for us. Every day they were doing something nice to, to express their, their gratitude for us coming down and uh, we felt tremendously blessed. Here, here the children are, are singing and, and going through the actions. Uh, I'm sure that the curriculum for the previous weeks before we uh, arrived had something to do with our visit. Here the ladies are with the, the food preparation. <coughs> they. <coughs> They feed the children, and the school is run three days a week, and they feed the children when they arrive, because they learn much better when they have nutrition. And uh, so all of the needs of the children are met. Their uh, physical needs, in terms of uh, proper feeding, 
because many of, the, of the, the children come from families where there's not an awful lot of good food uh, through the week. So three days of nutritious meals really means an awful lot for them. In addition to that, of course, the kids get exercise and, and fun and games, and, and we were building the, the wall around the play field so that they could play safely. And here we are. They, all, they love the, the ribbon cutting, and so they, they wanted us to cut the ribbon to the classrooms. There's a typical classroom where they'd be learning uh, math and uh, also language skills. And here they are, learning some songs. They, they had a lot of uh, Bible stories and, and uh, songs that they sang, learning about God and Jesus. And here they are, once again, uh, entertaining us. Every day they had uh, little presentations, and uh, we just felt like royalty. Once more, uh, pictures of the kids entertaining us. This is the, the workshop for, for the uh, woodworking. You can see the boys working on machines there. These are scales that they can use when they graduate <coughs> to uh, find employment. And there the boys are uh, wearing glasses and the safety goggles that we took down for them. They're just so happy to get that. And here the girls are uh, doing their sewing and learning the, these skills that they can translate into making a living or making money for, for the family. <coughs> now, when, when the students <coughs> graduate from, from the school, they can go on some of them <coughs> to uh, technical education. and. Uh, <coughs> These are some of the students that were, uh, <coughs> that were at the school and have gone on to technical college and they're working with electronic uh, skills. So they're showing the students uh, what they can become. And here, here's pictures of the bags of food. Anyway, um, we felt really blessed to be able to come and work on this project. Um, I, th I think we got more out of it than they got out of our, our work. Uh, it, it was just uh, a very spiritual experience and a very gratifying experience. The joy, the love, <coughs> the, uh, the caring that we saw of the staff and all of the, the people down there toward the children that they're working with and of course toward us. I think we were truly blessed to be able to go on this um, mission trip and do the little that we did to help in uh, the, the uh, development of that school. So it was not up to us who went on this trip, but before we knew it, almost six strangers were off to Guatemala. And who we'd meet and interact with there was even more part of a great plan completely out of our control. So I've done trips similar to this before where a group of volunteers who are also strangers go somewhere and help those less fortunate as us. I've been to uh, Peru and also South Africa on vol just volunteer trips, so not with the church. But never have I felt this strongly connected to those people. 
They say that love is a uni universal language, but God's love is something very special and blows normal love just right out of the water. <laughs> so what I wasn't expecting was how our common love for God, faith, and spirituality brought us so much closer than I would ever imagine. So my takeaway from this was that Sorry, I wrote this down so I wouldn't go over time because I usually talk too much. <laughs> and now I lost my place. <laughs> uh, my takeaway from this is God's plan for us will always exceed our earthly expectations. And we will never be able to imagine what he has in store for us, and that's where faith comes in. With faith, it is that we believe and trust in our God, not only to provide for us, but to also make decisions where our talents and individual skills can be best used to serve others, as scripture today explained. God calls us to serve others, but don't forget he also calls us to trust him and to believe in his plan, and that, and that is where the poem I read earlier comes in. Admitting, admitting that without him we cannot accomplish or flourish as much as we can. We can only fulfill our potential with him leading us, so be open to the path that he has for you, and you will be amazed at through him who you meet and the relationships that you can build through any and all barriers that our society creates. And just from that, um, it is a brief story from my experience. When we got there, we were very excited to meet people. And there was one particular woman uh, that worked in the kitchen. And every day I went to the school, I always go in and try to help, even though I probably wasn't supposed to. <laughs> and I try to help do dishes or help cook and clean. And this one kitchen lady, every day, she'd pull me aside and she'd teach me a new word. So she'd point to the soap, because she knew zero English. She'd point to the soap and she'd tell it to me in Spanish. And she would make me say it until I got it perfect. <laughs> some days it would be four or five times and some days she would hammer it in and tell me 10 or 12 times until I got it perfect. And, um, and when we left, Robin, our translator, had mentioned something that I was doing quite well with Spanish and it was because of this woman. And so every day she'd teach me a new word and we'd just smile and laugh and giggle and hug and that was it, there was no, we didn't uh, speak the same language and uh, didn't have conversation, I don't even know her name. <laughs> but when we went to go leave, um, she pulled the translator aside and he said, Carly, can you come here? And I walked over and uh, she grabbed my hands really tight and he said, she just wants you to know that she loves you so much. And I just started bawling because I'm like, she does. <laughs> she does love me so much. And he said, she's going to miss you. She doesn't want you to go. And then he continued to say that she wants to bless you the rest of your life and your family back home. And she can't wait if she can see you again. And again, I when I leave Peru and, and South Africa, it was, you know, it's sad. It was goodbye, but it was nothing like this. I just felt so connected to these people through our common faith. So that's my Thank you. Barb made me write it down. It's only one page. Because she said, Carly can speak as long as she wants, but you only get four and a half minutes. No worries. It's hard to believe that it's been seven weeks since we returned from Guatemala. I, I don't know where the time is. <laughs> Ten days in Guatemala that had a dramatic effect, I believe, on all of our lives, <coughs> but my life immensely. A friend of mine who's a retired lifelong missionary, served in Asia all her life, said to me before we were leaving, she said, oh, Short-term mission trips are life-altering. And I thanked her very much politely, and I thought to myself, yeah, oh, okay, sure, sure, whatever you say. I had no clue how life-altering it was. We were there for 10 days with the purpose of building a wall. We also had opportunity to go on home visitations and uh, visit with families and with children at the school and interact with them. Uh, the kids were from the community, the kids were from the church that was sponsoring it, and uh, we jokingly said that we were, amongst ourselves, we, we didn't tell them, um, that we were practice building Trump's wall. 
so that if they needed any extra help, you know, we, we could make a, a log wall. But we realized really quickly on that we were in the midst of a work that God was doing to build far more than just a block wall. I built block walls in the school board in London when I was in high school for my summer job. I built block walls for, for several summers. And never, never will I have been, was I touched the way I was from this trip. They were just block walls. This was something completely different. We were building relationships with a community of faith there. Two communities of faith, in fact. Uh, Gilberto and Ruth's church, and then the host church, Mount Hora Church, that was sponsoring this school as well. As the New Testament says in 1 Peter chapter 2, God is building us all like living stones into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. We thought we were going there, there as Carly said, to help the less fortunate, to strengthen and encourage the people that we met there. We went with gifts in hand. We went with the gifts of faith and hope and love for people of all ages. And we did offer all of that to the people. But we discovered that they encouraged and helped us and strengthened us, I think, perhaps more than we offered to them. Every interaction that we had with the people of Weiwei Tenango was at its heart pastorally based. That is, we, we had the care and the compassion of Christ in the midst of everything that we sought to do and in all of our interactions with the people. The Lord was at the center of it all. We took not only the gift bags that the Sunday School of this congregation provided uh, and, and handed them out, over 130 of them, we were also able to take <coughs> larger bags and hand out gift bags of food to the families that we went specifically to visit with. All six of us, I've, I've spent my life, my adult life, pastorally visiting with people, with families, individuals, in your homes, in nursing homes, in hospitals, wherever, wherever I meet with people. And when, when we were discussing we're going to go and visit hometown, I said, no, you, you girls go. I don't really want to go. You girls go. And they went. And then they said, it's your turn, boys, to go. All six of us found the home visits to be very difficult. And yet an amazing gift, a blessing to us that I never would have dreamt of. It was so difficult because these families had four walls and a dirt floor. Some of them had chickens running around in the house. There was no hydro, no plumbing, no kitchen. The kitchen was a fire outside where they baked uh, um, soft, taco, soft tacos uh, that they then tried to sell on the streets to raise a little bit of money to try and provide for the family. It was more than sad to see their living conditions. We take so much for granted here, and we're so easily distracted by the excess that we have. These people were so grateful that we went, not only to work amongst them, to serve amongst them, but then that we went and spent time with these poor of poor families. They were so glad they welcomed us with the open arms of Christ's love. And in their faith, they showed us that they already had everything. In the midst of their extreme poverty, we saw and experienced an amazing depth of loving gratitude that startled me and changed me. I don't think they realize how deeply they touched us, our lives, with the love of Jesus. We thought we were going down there to shower them with blessings and God. 
in his wisdom, opened our eyes to real blessings. God seeks to use each one of us to touch other people's lives with his care and with his compassion, one person at a time. The principal from the school named Luz, she visits all those families every month to offer care and practical help from the church to those young families. And while we're doing that visiting, while we're interacting with people, whether in Guatemala or in Kitchener, in Waterloo, in Holstein, wherever we might be, while we're doing that, God is doing His work through us and in us to transform all of our lives for His glory along His path of love. Jennifer. So I'm going to talk a bit about the families and the children in Guatemala. So going on a trip like this has always been kind of a dream of mine that I really wanted to do. So I wanted to start by saying thank you to everyone for supporting the trip and making it possible for you guys. We wouldn't have been able to do it. So many of you know that I started college this year. I started my Bachelor of Child and Youth Care this past fall at Humber College in Toronto. So one of the things I was really looking forward to was being able to interact with the children. On our first day on the work site, we had our first chance to interact directly with the children and their families. We helped the staff serve the children and families lunch. After lunch, the children began to play on the small playground, and a few of us ended up helping some of the smaller kids cross the monkey bars. Before we knew it, there was a crowd of children who wanted our help, whether they needed it or not, to cross the monkey bars. As soon as we would walk away, we would only be called back a few minutes later, and as soon as we, and as soon as we helped one kid, the prayer returned. Looking back on the map, that memory, it has been one of my favorite moments of the trip. Seeing how excited the kids were, and even how excited their parents were that the gringos, which is the name they have for us, um, were playing with them. Something that also really shocked me when we were there, um, about the families and the children, was the fact that everywhere we went, someone was taking a picture of us, or wanted a picture with us. We took pictures with young kids, older kids, excited kids, shy kids, who reluctantly took a picture with us because they wanted it, and even a group of usually teenage girls who were too scared to ask for a picture. As we like to say, we're now probably all over Facebook in Guatemala. One of the things that amazed me is so happy every family member and every child where, no matter where we went, it was really struck me even more when we went on our first home visit of the trip. Many of these families have absolutely nothing. They live in homes in every corner of any place you can find. Many of the homes are just about the size of my living room at home and some even smaller. Despite all of this, these families have so much love and give out even more love to others, even though they have just about nothing. Their faith is stronger than ever, and they truly believe God is with them, just as he is with all of us. One of the biggest examples of this was after the first home visit, we had offered to buy baskets from a family whose brother, with the sole breadwinner, was wrongfully in jail, and the father had passed away many years ago. They showed up the next day and insisted that they give them to us as gifts. It took some convincing, but we eventually were able to pay for the baskets. However, a few days later, they showed up with more baskets, and they insisted on giving them to us as gifts. In the end, we took the gifts, as we were told it would be disrespectful if we didn't. The fact that the family had just about nothing and they used these baskets to make money, um, and they were willing just to give them to us because they were so thankful for us visiting them and praying for them was really surprising and amazing for me to see. So before I sat down to write this, I took a moment to reflect on everything through the lens of what I've learned thus far in school. My professor talked to and taught about just about every single situation, such as the poverty and life that children and families in Guatemala have, just as some do here in Canada. The poverty and living conditions many of the children live in are situations is exactly what I've learned about, and seeing it in person makes it so much more real. But the biggest thing I realized is how resilient the children are. Being resilient is the ability to bounce back from some form of adversity. Most of the children and, family, children and families we met were facing at least one form of adversity in their life, if not more. Despite any of this, the children are happy and so full of love. They're going to school and excelling. They're learning trades and creating amazing things through woodworking and sewing. Seeing how these children are able to achieve such amazing things is just how important we support system and love and care is to children. All these qualities we seen in family and staff, who was mentioned earlier, were all volunteers at the school. Seeing the resiliency of these families and children in particular is something I will carry with me forever and hope to be able to turn to as inspiration in my future practice as a child and youth care practitioner. 
It was truly amazing to see how God can work in the lives of fam the families in Guatemala and ours to bring us to them and for him to bring them to us at the right moment in our lives. I hope that one day I will be able to go back and see how all these children and families have continued to be resilient and see how they have grown and changed. So I'm going to wrap things up with a little bit about the uh, daily activities, the building the wall, as you will, that uh, we've learned about some of the others. This is um, sort of the activities we did in building the wall. So the um, the first night, just because this was a, a group picture of everybody that was there, but it wasn't actually the first night. But the first night we got together, the one question that came up was, well, how hard did you want to work? And it seemed like a really odd question to us. And, and so, of course, our response was, well, we're going to work hard and we're going to complete the project as planned. So that sort of set the stage for uh, where we wanted to, uh, to head. So um, the next slide, maybe, I mean, um, this is the, um, the first night we had to, like, we, we flew in. And then we had to travel the next day uh, to get to the, to the place. And uh, that afternoon, we went out to the school just to see it before we started working. So this was the room that we met. We met the, uh, the host, like Gilberto was there. Uh, there was the pastor, there was the principal, and the uh, chairman of the church that was sponsoring the project. So this was the first time we met as a group, and this is where we met uh, in the kitchen of the church, or of the school. And uh, you know, it sort of became the focal point of where we operated because it was where the food was prepared for us for the breaks and uh, uh, snacks and that type of thing. It's where we washed up every day. It's where we got our fresh water. And uh, so it became sort of significant that this was our first snack together and uh, this is where it all started. So then we started on the first day of work and uh, it was a day for us to be comfortable with the local workers. Uh, they knew little English. Uh, this slide is actually just the uh, uh, inside where the water was. You see the little device up on the wall. That was the fresh water machine and so on. And, uh, that's where we washed up. So, on our first day, uh, as I said, the, the workers knew little English. We knew little Spanish, and so it sort of became questions and signs. What's this? Just as Carly talked about, where the the lady was teaching her Spanish while we were asking what this was, and they'd be t asking us, you know, what a hammer is in, in English and so on. And uh, the famous line was, uno mas, one more. And it applied to one more block, or it applied to one more row of blocks, and it sort of became our, our mantra out on the wall. And the experience was, of course, mixing mortar on the ground, and, uh, uh, you know, not having a cement mixer, everything was done manually on the ground. And uh, the first day we found there was a lot of rework. You put a block on, it wasn't quite level, you take it off, put some more mortar on. But <laughs> as we went on, we got better, of course. Uh, the brakes were a time to uh, cool off and relax a little bit. And uh, this is where uh, some of the pictures that you saw earlier of the kids playing on the monkey bars and, and that type of thing, that it was also a time of interaction with the folks that were there. And uh, at lunch, I think we had Okanda at least once a day. Uh, they were very proud to have us there, and they, they, they had Okanda quite a bit. The food was great, uh, too much to start, but uh, um, you know, there was fruit, yogurts, special Guatemalan meals. Uh, probably our most memorable meal was uh, hot dogs. You say, how can it be memorable? Well, it had all the fixing, it had the buns, but the hot dogs were cold, so it was cold hot dogs. <laughs> Friendships grew and you know everyone became more comfortable and we put in the effort and the workers I think respected us for uh, uh, what we did after their early hesitation as to whether we were going to succeed or not. And uh, we'd see some of the workers uh, and the support team at school. Uh, we'd see them at night at some of the services and some of the interactions. So uh, work and worship sort of became connected as, uh, as the week went on. And the children from the school become comfortable around us, and as you've seen, uh, some came up to have pictures, and uh, uh, there was a, uh, a house just over the wall as we were building the wall. You'd look over and there was a house, and sometimes the child or the mom would come around, or they'd wave as we were working away, so it was, uh, it was really special. And, um, and, and I guess there was another uh, one day, it was hot to us, 
but there was a visitor and he had a scarf and a hat and he was all bundled up, so I don't know, it must have been a cold day in Guatemala when he was there. So, so to wrap it up, uh, I think you know a few things stand out in my mind from uh, the daily interactions. I think, uh, as you've heard from the others, the gratitude and the thankfulness for the work that was accomplished uh, by those uh, in Guatemala. Uh, each evening we had a team sharing, and I know at one of the evenings I said, you know, we're just building a wall, but the reaction from the people as we were building the Taj Mahal was unbelievable. And I think just to tie things back to that first room, oh right, sorry, I forgot about the loony. We want to finish, we thought we'd leave our Canadian mark and uh, put a loony in the wall, so there's a, a memory of Canada at the top of the wall. Um, to tie back to where I started with the kitchen, um, we, we finished there as well. So on our day, the night before we left that afternoon, uh, after the celebration we wrapped up and we completed the wall and we were together and uh, we had our last snack together and the emotion in the room there weren't too many dry eyes at all and it was a connection I don't think anybody will uh, forget you know it's a combination of pride uh, of being able to complete the wall because uh, there was even comments made during the week well they didn't think we'd be made 50 percent of it done so it was nice you know to to complete what we said we did as, as we set up front but the gratitude from the local team, the emotion from the friendships that we built over the week, it was only a week, but the amazing friendships that, that were built over that time and the memories and, uh, and the interactions that we had through the week that, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was a wall, but there was so much more compared to the others. And it was hard work, and uh, it was an accomplishment to building a better opportunity for the local children, but the real result was the blending of the cultures enjoying some fun times together, building some personal relationships, and then in sharing in a church relationship to God's glory together. I feel like I should say something like, and this is the end of the show. Um, anyways, a lot of and as you can tell, there's a lot of passion involved in um, going on a mission trip, and we had a very strong team. There were only six of us, but um, if there had been 20 of us, we wouldn't have been any stronger. We are, one of the themes when we were in Guatemala was that we always got fed. So, we are offering you some Guatemalan treats downstairs after the service. Um, so make sure that you drop by and uh, give us a, a a chance to, to share some, some of those with us with you.